And you must leave all the sins that you commit openly and secretly. The outer sins and the inner sins. What is the definition of ithm or dhanb or sin? To sin means to do anything that is against the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do anything that's against the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So anytime we break the rules of Qur'an or we break the rules of sunnah, we are committing a sin. Now what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean here by outer sins and inner sins? Outer sin means to steal, to drink alcohol, to eat pork, to consume interest, etc. Inner sins means to have lust in your heart, unlawful desires, greed, love of wealth, love of dunya, to have envy and jealousy for your fellow Muslim, to have spite, malice and hatred for your fellow Muslim, to have arrogance, pride and conceit. All of these things are inner sins. And we should know that just as haram it is to do an outer sin, it's equally haram to do an inner sin. For example, none of us would ever dream of even taking one bite of pork. And just as haram it is to have one morsel of pork, it is as equally haram to have one drop of arrogance in your heart. Or it is as equally haram to have one ounce of lust in your heart. So it means that the inner sins are as important as the outer sins in fact, the inner sins can sometimes be even more crippling than the outer sins. The likeness of a sin is that it starts out as a small threat. That if you catch it in time, it's easy to snap. But if you let yourself continue and persist in sin, then that sin becomes so strong, it's like an anchor that holds you down. Our Mashaikh say that a person should be so scared of committing a sin, that he shouldn't even come near a sin, the same way that if there is a huge electrical wire, 1,000 volts live wire, the child won't even come within inches or feet of that wire because he's so afraid to be shot. So just like that, the true Muslim, the believing person, is so scared of disobeying Allah, is so scared of earning the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he or she won't even come anywhere near a sin. Hafiz ibn Qayyum rahimahullah said, that, oh my friend, don't look at how small or how great the sin that you may be doing, but look how, how great that being is against whom you are sinning. So it means that there is nothing small that is a sin. Even a single glance that we're not supposed to look at, even lingering our gaze somewhere we're not supposed to see, even that, imagine you're breaking against the, breaking the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In front of him you are disobeying. Atar bin Abi Rabah, Rahimahullah is a famous tabi'in amongst the followers. He was one of the teachers of Imam al Munifa. And he used to tell his students that, Oh my students, when you sin and you close all the doors from which creation can see you, you lock the doors, you close your room, you close your windows, you draw your curtains. He said, My students, when you close all the doors from which creation can see you, but you cannot close the door through which your Creator can see you. So what if Allah SWT on the Day of Judgment says, that, oh my servant, you took such great care to hide your sins from everyone. Were you not ashamed at all in committing your sin in front of me? You made sure that nobody saw you sinning. You made sure that nobody would find out that you committed that sin. The husband hides the sin from the wife. The wife hides the sin from the husband. The children hide their sins from their parents. The young man hides the sin from his wife. So we hide our sins, we conceal our sins. What if Allah says to us, that you were so ashamed in front of creation that you hid your sin, do I have even less value in your eyes than creation that you felt no shame before me? So it means that leaving sin is something incredible that we have to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَلَرُوا ذَاهِ وَبَعْتِنَا that you must leave all the sins that you commit, the ones that you do openly, the ones that you do secretly, the outward sins and the inner sins. 
In another place in Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said, Tubu ila Allah Tawbatun Nasiha. That you must repent unto Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Now this word Toba is a very interesting thing. Because Allah in Arabic said Tubu ila Allah. He added this word called ila, which means do Toba towards Allah. What it means is that Toba is what you would call in English a paradigm shift. It means that you're living a life of sin, or you're engrossed in one particular sin. It's not just enough to leave it. You have to totally turn yourself all the way away from that sin and orient yourself back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because unless you remember Allah, it's very difficult to leave sin. Just think, ask any young man or woman who falls into sin. And ask them, at the moment you sinned, were you remembering Allah? And they'll say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was so lost in my sin, I had forgotten Allah, I had forgotten the book of Allah, I had forgotten the messenger of Allah, I had even forgotten that I was somebody who believed in La ilaha illallah, I was so absorbed in my sin. So if a person who is distant from Allah, from the book of Allah, from the messenger of Allah, how can that person hope to live his or her life like Abdullah, like a servant and slave of Allah? So tubu illallah means to repent from your sins, but also to change your entire ways, change everything about yourself, illallah, and orient yourself back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Direct yourself back to Allah. Bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala back into your life, so it makes it easy for you to leave sins. Fakih Abu Laytha Samarqandi rahimahullah, one of our great scholars, he said that there are four things that a person has to do to make sure their tawbah is accepted. So the first thing a person must do is that he must, well before we do that, there are three things that a person does that increase the severity and the magnitude of their sin. The first thing is to do a sin over and over and over again. To trick yourself and think that it's just one last time. It's just one last look. I'll do it one last time and then I'll repent later. In fact, our Mashaikh say that that's the strange thing about human beings. It's not that they commit a sin but that they fool themselves into committing that sin again. And they fool themselves into thinking that they'll repent of that sin some later time in the future. So the first thing that increases the severity of our sin is that we do some sin over and over and over again. Sometimes it's shaitan that makes us sin. Sometimes it's our nafs that makes us sin. It's a very interesting thing that all of you know that we have these two things, nafs and shaitan, right? And these are the two things that make us sin. So if I were to ask you today, that you tell me, how do you know when you have a thought to sin, when you have a desire to sin, when you feel a whisper to sin, how do you know whether that's shaitan or that's your nafs? Anybody here tell me the answer? How do we distinguish, how do we know whether we're doing that sin because of shaitan or whether we're doing it because of nafs? I remember in America, there's this famous city, all of you probably know, that in the month of Ramadan, the shayateen are locked up. So there's some young men in America who are still caught in a particular sin and they would wonder, why are we doing the sin? Shaitans are all locked up and we're still involved in the sin. It means that that sin was coming from their nafs. Actually, everybody has some sin that they're doing, no matter how religious we might be, no matter how much of the work of the deen we're doing, everybody has at least one or two, three, four sins that he just cannot leave. Whether it's his anger, whether it's his inability to control his gaze, whether sometimes he has a loose tongue, he exaggerates, he lies, whether he backbites other people, whether he doesn't like it when his fellow Muslim gets something in life, he has envy, jealousy, he doesn't like other people to be praised, he doesn't like it if he sees his neighbor gets a new car, he doesn't like it if his friend has success in business. Everybody has some sin inside of them that just cannot leave. The month of Ramadan comes, to make dua, they still can't leave it. They go for Umrah, they make dua there, they come back, they still can't leave it. They go for Hajj, they come back, they still can't leave that sin. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them or shy, they actually explained us how you can tell that whether that sin is because of your nafs or whether that sin is because of shaitan. So listen carefully. If you think of doing a sin, right, if the desire to do a particular sin comes in your mind and you suppress it, you control yourself, but again the desire to commit the same sin comes in your mind, and then you suppress it. And the same sin keeps coming into your mind over and over and over again. Right? This is particularly, you'll see this, the case in sins of the lust or sins of desire. Over and over the same desire comes in your mind. That's a sign that that sin or the thought of that sin is coming from your nafs. Why? Because the nafs is like a small child. It's stubborn. When it sets it hard on something, it doesn't give up. Like imagine if you took a hot bulb off the, uh, the light and you put it on the table and your small boy wants to touch it. 
Well, you're going to make sure you just touch it because you don't want him to get burned. That small boy is going to insist on touching that bell. He's going to start yelling, he's going to start screaming. You can try to fool him and give him other things. He doesn't care, he's got one goal, he wants to do that thing. Just like that, the nafs, when it gets a desire in it, it just wants to fulfill that desire. So if you get the thought to do the same sin over and over and over again, know that that is your nafs. On the other hand, if you get a thought to do a sin, and then you suppress it, you control it. Then you get a thought to do a different type of sin, and you suppress it and you control it. And then you get a thought to do a third different type of sin, that means it's shaitan. Why? Because shaitan doesn't care which sin you commit, He's not stubborn. He just wants to get you in any type of sin that he can. If he tries to lure you with one sin and he fails, he immediately will try to present another one. If that fails, he'll try to present a third one. In the end, at the very least, if he can't get you to sin, he'll try to keep you from doing something that is good. To look at our Mashai, they were such people of insight that it would explain to us the difference between the nafs and shaitan. So the first thing that increases the magnitude of our sin is that we do it over and over again we fool ourselves that we'll do it one more time. And this is especially in the sins of the nafs. You can imagine your nafs is like a dog. And you're trying to hold that dog on a leash. So when you try to hold a dog on a leash, and if he pulls away, and you let him go, next time you try to hold him on the leash, it's going to be all that more difficult, because now he knows. that All I have to do is pull a little bit on this leash, and I'll let go. Just like that, that's the case with the young man when he gives him to his nuff and he commits this sin and he says he'll do it one last time. Gradually he becomes addicted to that sin. He can't leave that sin. Each and every time he does that sin it becomes all the more harder for him to go and eventually it's like the man who's trying to control the dog but now there's no hope in him trying to hold the dog on the leash because the dog knows all I have to do is pull and I can get go. So the first thing that increases the severity of sin is doing it over and over and over again. The second thing is that if you lose hesitation, you no longer feel ashamed in committing that sin. For example, there may be, have been a time that you felt embarrassed. You wouldn't have wanted other people to catch you in that sin. You would have lowered your gaze in public because you would be embarrassed that maybe these people will see me, that I have a beard. How embarrassing will it be if they see that I'm staring at this woman? But over time, you lose that hesitation. You lose that shame. As long as there are no Muslims around you, there's no Ustad, Imam, Shaykh, Mawlana around you, you have no embarrassment doing your sin. You have no embarrassment letting your gaze loose. That's another thing that increases the severity of our sin. And the third thing is, is if somebody gets that deep into sin, his heart becomes so hardened that he even brags about his sin, he shares his sin with friends. He tells other people about the sins that he does. So these are the three things that increase the severity of sin. So Fakir Amal Alayhi Samakan Rahim Allah said that there are four things a person has to do to make sure their tawbah is accepted and that the repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepted. The first thing is that they must pledge sincerely in their heart that, Oh Allah, I promise I will never do that sin again. That they have, must have a true deep desire. They must be crying over that sin. Their heart must be paining. They must be disgusted with themselves that, Ya Allah, how can I keep displeasing you? I must be so repugnant in your eyes. Allah, today I promise you I will never commit that sin again. Now some people ask, well how can I say that because I know I'm going to do it again. There's so many times that I've made tawbah to Allah that I fell back in the same sin, that I made tawbah to Allah that I fell back in the same sin. It comes in hadith that on the day of judgment one person will be raised who lived his life exactly like this. That he used to sin, then he used to repent to Allah. Then he would sin again, then he would repent to Allah. And Allah Ta'ala will say to the angels that look at the servant of mine, truly the shaitan and nafs, they never relented in making him sin, but my servant, he was also unrelenting in making tawbah to me. So because of his unrelenting tawbah to me, I will forgive him this day for his sins. Just look at this life like a boxing match. Now when a boxer gets knocked down, the coach wants nothing more than for him to get up. The day the boxer starts getting up, stops getting up, that's when his coach is going to be upset. As long as every time he gets knocked down, he gets up, the coach will be happy with him. That's the same condition. So we should never delay making tawbah or think that, oh, what's the point of making tawbah? I'm going to have to do that sin again. Look, when your clothes get dirty, right? You wash them. Nobody says, I'm not going to wash my clothes because they're just going to get dirty again. So just like that, from time to time, you have to wash yourself. 
You have to wash your heart, you have to purify your soul of its sins, and hope to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is the final time. Once there were two young men arguing, and an old man walked by, and they said, Oh old man, can you come? Maybe you can resolve our disagreement. And he said, What is it that you're disagreeing about? And the two young men said that we are disagreeing about who is more beloved to Allah. That person who never committed sins ever in his life, or that young man who fell into sin, but then he turned back to Allah in tawbah and repentance. So the old man said that, oh young man, I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I can tell you what I think based on my own experience. And he said, I'm a weaver, I weave large tapestries on my lawn. And I have to follow many yarns, many pieces of thread across the tapestry. He said that when one yarn, when one thread snaps, when it breaks, I have to tie it back. But once I've tied that thread back, Throughout the tapestry when I'm weaving, I always keep my special gaze on that thread that snapped, lest it snap again. So maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's special mercy, his special gaze of rahmah and ghanam, of mercy and generosity is on that servant of his who broke away from him, but who tied himself back through Tawbah. So it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of beings. This is why he says in Quran, Ya ayyuhal insan ma ghazaka bin al kareem. Oh, humanity, what has deceived you and betrayed you about your kind and beloved Lord? So the first condition of Tawbah, to make our Tawbah accepted, is to make sure to have a firm intention that we will never stop, uh, we will stop making that sin, and at the very least, that we will never stop making Tawbah. No matter how an unrelenting shaitan and the nafs might be in the future, we will be as unrelenting in our istighfar and Tawbah. You should just think that if Allah SWT never tires of forgiving us, then why should we tire of asking him for forgiveness? The second condition of Tawbah is that you have to forgive other people for the sake of Allah. This is very important. It comes in a hadith that on the Layl Taqal, on the night of color, everybody's du'as are accepted except that person who has a grudge, a bad feeling, malice, some spite and hatred towards his fellow Muslim. That woman or man, his or her du'a is not accepted on the night of Layl Taqal. It means that we have to forgive people if we expect Allah SWT to forgive us. Allah says in the Quran, <coughs> He describes that you have to be forgiving, not just to the Muslims, but an-nas to all of humanity. But what is our condition? That if somebody does something bad to us, even if we're right, we're justified in being angry, we get so angry we tell our friends that I don't want to see that person's face. If that person's there, I don't want to be there. This happens within families. People tell me here it happens within blood brothers. So much anger and hatred towards one another. I don't want to see that person's face. I wish that person would not even be on the face of the earth. How can we, who are we, what is our rank, what is our value that we can have such anger? What if Allah SWT is to treat us that way? If we are justified in being angry to somebody, surely Allah SWT is justified in being angry to us. Surely we have done so many things, violated so many rules of Allah SWT. In fact, if you think about it, it would have been totally appropriate for Allah to punish us immediately whenever we sin. The second we used our eye in disobedience, He should have made us blind. The second we walked somewhere we shouldn't have been, He should have made us crippled. The second we touched something or let, reached our hand towards something we shouldn't do, He should have made us numb in our limbs. The second we listened to something that we shouldn't listen, Allah should have made us deaf. If you think like that, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the most justified in taking us to account, if he decided to take us to account for our shortcomings, all of us sitting here today, we will be blind, we will be deaf, we will be mute, we will be dumb, we will be crippled. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so forgiving, if he is so merciful, it comes in a day, Prophet Sam said, that have mercy towards one another, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have mercy towards you. So it means that if we wish Allah ta'ala to accept our tawbah, we must forgive all the people in our heart. In fact, all of you know there's these things called hukuk Allah and hukuk al-ibad. The rights of Allah and the rights that creation have over you. So if you broke a rule of Allah as you sinned against them, then you can ask Allah for forgiveness. But if you hurt somebody's heart, if you did something wrong to someone, all of you know you're supposed to actually go to that person and ask them to forgive you. Now let's say you can't ask that person. Maybe he's died, maybe he lives somewhere far away. So what can you do to save yourself from the day of judgment that he'll come and take his rights over you? So one of our Mashaikh taught us that what you should do is you should forgive other people. Why? Because it comes in a day that if you have a right over a person, in other words, somebody wronged you, and if you wish, you can collect from them on the day of judgment. But instead, you choose to forgive them 
And it comes in a day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you many times, multiple times more reward than you would have been able to collect from that person. So you can make the intention that, Oh Allah, I forgive all the people who have any rights over me. Give me so much reward from that that it will cover all the people who have rights over me. I forgive all the people who I have rights over. Allah Ta'ala give me so much reward in exchange for that that it will suffice to cover all the people who have rights over me. So it means we should forgive the grudges that we have in people. So the first condition of having our tawbah accepted was that we should promise, we should intend that we will never commit that sin again. And the second condition was that we should forgive the grudges of all the people. Hazrat Malana Ashraf Ali Tanbari Malana writes in one of his books a strange incident. He says that once there was a man and wife and the wife did something very bad. And everybody would have said that the man would have been justified in being angry with her. Even if the man gave her divorce, he would have been fully justified. That's what a terrible thing the wife did. But the wife came to the man and she was crying and she asked him to forgive her. So that man looked at his wife and a thought came to his heart that, Oh Allah, truly she has done something wrong, but she is coming to me in sorrow, she is coming to me in remorse, she is coming to me in regret. She is asking me to forgive her what she did. So oh Allah, because she is your servant, Allah ki bandi, as they say in Urdu, because she is your servant, I will forgive her for your sake. And that man forgave her, and then they lived happily ever after. Then later that man passed away, and then somebody saw him in a dream. So Hazrat Tangan Abtai writes that when somebody saw that man in a dream, they asked him what happened, and he said that, oh, Allah SWT forgave me for everything. And they said, why? He said that Allah SWT told me that, oh my servant, when that woman, she did something wrong, and you would have been in your haq, in your right, to punish her, to be angry with her. But you said in your heart that you forgave her because she is my servant, to know my servant, I am infinitely more merciful than you, infinitely more kind than you. If you forgive her because she was my servant today, I forgive you because you are my servant. So it means that if we forgive other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be happy with us. Allah ta'ala will say that look at this person, he is waiving the rights of others. Maybe Allah will waive his right to punish us. So the second condition of making our tawbah accepted was to forgive all the grudges, forgive everybody for everything they may have done with us. The third thing is to keep ourselves away from the people who brought us to that sin. And this is very important. This is the major reason when we make toba, we still fall back into that sin. Because you still hang out with that person who took you to sin. You still go to that gathering of sin. You still keep the company of people who invite you to sin. So then how sincere is your toba? How sincere is your repentance if you're still sticking yourself right back into that environment? In fact, if you reflect, every night we promise to Allah that we're going to leave the people who invite us to sin. Every night, every one of us promise. How? In Salatul Witr, in Dua of Kunud, all of us say these words, وَنَخْلَعُ وَنَتْرُكُ مَا يَفْجُرُكُ وَنَخْلَعُ Oh Allah SWT, I will isolate myself. I will keep myself away. وَنَتْرُكُ And I will leave, I will reject, I will repudiate مَا يَفْجُرُكُ That person who disobeys you. So that means we promise this to Allah every night. That Allah, we're going to leave the people who disobey you. So the third condition to have our tawbah, our repentance accepted, is that we must leave the people who disobey Allah. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah has written in his book that a bad friend is worse than a snake. Why? Because he says when a snake bites you, a poisonous bite, it sends you into the mouth of death, but when a bad friend stings you, he sends you into the mouth of hellfire. Then Imam al-Ghazali goes one step further. And he said that a bad friend is even worse than shaitan. Why? He said because shaitan only puts the thought of sin in your mind. That's all shaitan does. Whereas the bad friend, he will pressure you to commit sin. He will take you by the hand. He will accompany you to the place of sin. He will involve you in sin. He will not leave you until you committed that sin. He will lead you right into that sin. It means the bad friend is even worse than shaitan. So the third condition of making repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means we must leave our bad friends, the bad company, the bad gatherings, the bad environment, whatever it is that causes us to do that sin. Whether it's an internet connection, whether it's some type of job, whether it's something that we're doing, some company that we keep, anything that we do that leads us to commit that sin, we must cut that thing off. Otherwise it means we're not sincere in repenting to Allah. 
And the fourth condition, or the fourth thing that Fakiyah Bala Samrakanahi Mullah writes that will help you in making your tawbah, your repentance accepted by Allah, is that if you increase in your good deeds, that you don't despair when you fall into sin. Because no, when a person falls into sin, it's only natural for people like us who are sitting in the masjid, who have some desire to be close to Allah, it's only natural that you feel sad in your heart. This is normally what happens to a pious Muslim. That he commits sin and immediately he feels bad about it. He can feel the distance, the gap that widened up between him and Allah. He can feel that I did something wrong, I must be so displeasing to Allah. But some people, this leads them into depression, this leads them into inaction. They go to sleep at night committing that sin, and they think, how can I wake up for Fajr in this state of sin? So they won't even bother, they won't even try to wake up for their Salah. So they'll commit some type of sin, and they just won't feel like worshipping Allah because they feel so distant, they feel so bad. So no. The fourth condition of making your tawbah accepted is even if you commit sin, you should never despair of the mercy of Allah. Why? Because Allah said in Quran, Ya ibadi alladhina asrafu ala anfusikum la taqnatu wa rahmatullah. So who is this addressed to? Alladhina asrafu. That those people who do israf, those people who wrong themselves, it means those people who sin. Allah specifically addressed the people who sin in this ayah. That those people who break my rules, those people who sin against my commands, those people who break the sunnah of beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la taqnatu wa rahmatullah, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. No matter how low you may have gone, no matter how sin, many sins you may have accumulated, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is all the more greater than that. So number one thing Allah said in this ayah is that we should never despair of His mercy. But more than that, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala address these sinners? Did He call them fusaq? Did He call them fuj- uh, Did He call them corrupt ones? Did He call them all sinful ones? No. He still called them ibad. He still called them the servants of Allah. It means that no matter how low, no matter how deep you sin, Allah does not kick you out from the servanthood. He does not divorce the believers. So Allah said, Oh my friend, my slave, my creation, that no matter how deep you sin, number one, don't despair of the mercy of Allah, and number two, know that I still view you as an ibad, as a servant amongst the servants of Allah. And more than that, number three, Allah in Quran said, Ya ibadi. For those of you who know Arabic, know that this is Ya for nisbat. He said, My servants. So he didn't divorce us from his ownership. So he said, all those of you who sin, who wrong yourselves, number one, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Number two, know that you are still amongst the ranks of Allah's servants. And number three, ya ibadi, I still call you mine. That you are still mine. Just like a mother. All of you know that a criminal, a terrible person in the world, there's nobody in the world who loves him but his mother. The mother cannot give up because at the end of the day, no matter how terrible his son is, no matter if her son is sitting in prison on death row, she say that he is my son. It's the nisbat. So all of us have this nisbat, this relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He created us, that He is our rub, that He is our cherisher, our sustainer, the one who nurtured us up from the moment we were born. So it means that the fourth thing that we should make sure we do is no matter how deep we fall in sin, we should never despair of the mercy of Allah. We should have full certainty in our heart that no matter how bad I am. Allah SWT will accept my repentance and we should always continue in fulfilling our duties, making our salah. Then, Fakiyah Malay Fahimullah writes that a person who makes tawbah, just like there were four conditions to make your tawbah accepted, that person who makes tawbah, he gets four rewards. The first thing is that that person who repents from his sins and his sincere in his repentance, according to the way we describe, and Allah Ta'ala accepts his repentance, then he becomes as if he never had any sin. Comes in hadith that that person who repents from his sins becomes like that person who never had any sins, who has no sins upon him. This is the power of Allah. He can erase the record of our sins. He'll erase the hard drive. He erases all the records. He will erase the effect of your sins. In fact, we should make dua to Allah that Allah don't just erase the effects of our sins, Erase the memories of sin. Erase the memories of the pleasure that we took when we sinned. Erase each and every aspect of sin from our body. Ya Allah, not just forgive our sins, but the gap that was formed between you and us because of that sin, out of your love and mercy, draws close to you once again. Do we not see that if you get your parents upset, or if a wife gets her husband upset, and she goes to the husband and says, Oh husband, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, 
I promise I'll never do it again. And if the husband says to her very tersely, okay, fine, you're forgiven. The wife doesn't give up. She doesn't just want the husband to forgive her. She's not going to give up until the husband smiles upon her once again. Until the husband shows her affection once again. So when we ask Allah to forgive us for our sins, it should be not, not just to forgive us for our sins, but oh Allah, smile upon us once again. Draw us close to you once again. Shower your love upon us once again. The second reward that a person gets from Maktoba is that Allah Ta'ala can actually preserve us from shaitan. Because Allah said in the Quran, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. That verily on Allah Ta'ala's servants, Allah Ta'ala addresses shaitan that you will have no power over them. They will become mahfuz or preserved by Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. It means that none of us have the ability in ourselves to save ourselves from sin, but if we are sincere in our repentance, we truly beg Allah to forgive us, then Allah can see to it that we are preserved from sin. Allah can save us from the tests of sin. Or Allah can give us the strength to overcome these tests. The example Hazrat Tanbiyan Tanbiyan gives in one of his books is if a person goes to somebody's house, if you go to your friend's house and your friend has a dog, and there's this dog sitting at the door, a very uh, a killer dog and attack type dog. So you have three options. One is you can say, okay, well, because this dog is here, I'm not going to visit my friend. You can turn around and return home. Number two is you can try to fight that dog. And number three, you can simply call your friend, and when you call your friend, he'll come and he'll tell the dog to stay away from you. So Hazrat Tanvi Tani writes that the dog is like shaitan, and the friend is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have, either we can give up and just say we're going to be people of sin and return home, or we can try to fight shaitan ourselves, and that's very difficult. Or you can repent to Allah, make Allah your friend, then Allah SWT will simply order shaitan that you have no control over this person anymore. So the next reward, that this, the other reward that we get from making our tawbah is that Allah SWT saves us from the wiles and the wounds of shaitan. Allah can preserve us from sin. Because truly, my friends, none of us has the ability to save ourselves from sin. In fact, think, we should, normally we should think about all the sins that we do, but if you reflect on all the sins that you don't do, why is it that you don't do it? You have every opportunity in the world to do it. It's just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has blessed us, He has given us the tawfiq, the ability and the success to stay away from those sins. So we should beg Allah that, Ya Allah, just as you have kept me away from this sin, Ya Allah, keep me away from all those other sins that I'm still doing. The third reward is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will include this person in the name of His awliya. Because Allah says in the Quran, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people of Tawbah. And Hadith Prophet said, Atta'ibu Habiballah, that the person who repents to Allah becomes the beloved of Allah. So it means by turning to Allah, by repenting to Him, we enter the ranks of His beloveds. Not simply of His lovers, of His beloveds. That Allah will bestow His love upon us. So this is such an incredible, this is just a great sign of the mercy of Allah. You would think that only those people who are super in their taqwa should be the beloved of Allah. Not the people who sin and repent. The people who sin and repent, they should be people who just barely pass. No. Allah Ta'ala says that if you sin and repent, not will I simply give you bare passing marks. In Allah yuhibbu tawabin, I will love you deeply. So the person who repents, the other reward he gets is that he becomes the beloved friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It seems it's getting late, so I'll just conclude with one last story. At the time of the Tameen, there was a famous Tami by the name of Sheikh Hassan al-Basra Many of you must have heard his name. This was such a big Tami that he used to give the dars of Qur'an in the largest masjid in Basra, in modern day Iraq. And upon whose order did he give that dars of Qur'an? Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu in his time of Khilafah told Hassan al-Basri that you must teach the Qur'an in the masjid in Basra. Imagine the rank of such a person. Thousands of people used to listen to his dars of Qur'an, used to be his students, men and women, they all used to take benefit from him. There was one woman who was one of his very sincere students. And she became widowed in her middle age. And she had one son only. So she thought to herself that rather than get married again, I would devote all my time to raising up my son. But when the son grew old, the son actually left the ways of the day. The son became a very big sinner. He used to sin in all types of ways. So the mother used to always advise him that, oh my son, why don't you leave your sins? Why don't you repent? Why don't you turn to Allah? Why don't you come with me and I'll take you to Shaykh Hassan al-Basri and he can teach you how to repent, he can teach you how to make yourself close to Allah. 
So she would always try to work on her son. Sometimes the son, just, just for the sake of it, just to get his mother off his back, he would go with her to Hassan al-Basri. And Sheikh Hassan al-Basri would give him time, would try to advise him, would try to tell him to repent of his ways. But then the son, because he was just doing it for his mother's sake, he would go back to his life of sin. So much so that over time, Sheikh Hassan al-Basri, he began to be fed up with this young man. So this young man then became so famous that he was one of the greatest sinners of Basra. A number of years passed and all of a sudden that young man became very ill. He had a very severe illness and then the doctors or the healers in that time said that this person is in his last moments. He's in a fatal illness and he's going to die very shortly. And he was in extreme pain and the mother, she was just crying because this was her only son. She had not taken another husband because of him. So the last thing she had left in life was about to leave her. And she was crying over the fact that her son had never repented of his sins. So she was addressing her son and she said, Oh my son, will you not repent of your ways? Do you not see what is the result of people who sin? And something happened in that sickness that opened up that young man's eyes. And he said that, Oh my mother, now I realize that truly Allah SWT must be very angry with me and that's why he has given me such a painful sickness. That's why he has chosen to take my life at such a young age. Mother, I realize now that I have should repent of my ways. But I don't know the first thing about how to repent. So all my mother used to take the name of your teacher, Hassan al-Basri. Can you not go to him and call him? Because I cannot move. Can you not go to him and call him and ask him to come to me? And maybe I can repent at his hands. So that mother whose eyes were crying from sorrow, now she started to cry from joy. This was the greatest thing, the thing she had wanted to hear her whole life, that her son was willing to repent of his sins, and that her son was willing to take her Shaykh Hassan al-Basri as his teacher. Then the son said, Oh my mother, before you go, just in case I die before you manage to come back with Shaykh Hassan al-Basri, then ask him to lead my Janaza prayer. So the mother, she rushed off to Shaykh Hassan al-Basri's house. And this was some time before he was about to give the Dars al-Quran. And so she knocked on his door, and Shaykh Hassan al-Basri asked her, Who is it? And she replied, I'm so-and-so. And he said, Oh woman, what have you come to my door for? And she said, Oh Shaykh, my son, he wishes to repent. And Shaykh Hassan al-Basri said, Oh woman, how many times would you let your son fool you? He has deceived you and broken your heart so many times. Why do you always listen to him? He is just faking and deceiving you once again. She said, no, he's sincere, he really wants to repent. She Hassan al-Basri said, woman, I have to prepare my dars that I give in front of thousands of people. How many times do you wish that I leave my work for the sake of your son? How can I leave the needs of thousands just for the sake of your son? So then the woman then she tried it, oh Shaykh, at least if he dies, can you, will you read his janazah? And Shaykh Hassan al-Basri said that no. Because Shaykh Hassan al-Basri, this was his legal opinion, he said that in my view that that person who deliberately leaves Salah, he becomes a kafir. And your son never prays Salah. He is someone who has left his Salah, mutaammadan fakar kafar, that he has left his Salah deliberately, he has become a kafir, an unbeliever, and I will not read janazah over such a person. So he denied the second request. So the mother then went back into sorrow. And she started crying tears and she went back to her son, thinking how will she face her son? So when she went back to her son, and her son saw that she came alone, her son knew what happened. And he said that, oh mother, Sheikh Hassan Basri, he refused to come, didn't he? And she said, yes, my son. And then she said, did he at least agree to pray my janazah when I die? And the mother, she said, no. He said, he won't even pray your janazah when, he, he die, when you die. So the young man said that, oh my mother, truly now I know how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be upset with me. How angry Allah must have become with me that your shaykh, the wali of his time, does not wish to come and accept my tawbah. So, oh my mother, now I have one other request. One other last request, that when I die, oh my mother, wrap a cord around my neck and drag my corpse along the ground and tell the people that this is the fate of those who disobey Allah. And just saying these words, he passed away in his mother's lap. Now imagine the condition of that mother whose son's last words are this, that when I die, drag a, wrap a cord around my neck and drag me around the land and tell people that this is the fate of those people who disobey Allah. The second the son passed away, a knock came on the door. And the woman, she went to the door and she said, who is it? And the answer was Hassan al-Basri. And the woman said, that, oh Shaykh, how is it that you have come? 
And Shaykh Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said that, O woman, know that when you left, I sat down to prepare my dars, to prepare my lecture, and while I was sitting, I began to feel drowsy and I fell asleep. When I fell asleep, a voice called out to me and said, O Hassan al-Basri, you think you are the wali of this time, but yet you refuse to pray the janazah over my wali? He said, that's all I needed to hear, and O woman, I have rushed to your door. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown me that the tawbah of your son is accepted. Today, not only will I read his janazah, I will give him ghusl, I will bathe him. I will put kafan on him, I will wrap him in the shroud, I will lay him in the grave myself, and I will pray my janazah over him. So it means, my friends, that even if we lead a life of sin, no matter how deep we are, if we turn to Allah sincerely in our heart, in repentance, if we ask Him to forgive us for our sins, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true to His word, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَابِينَ That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people who repent to Him. وَآخِرًا دَعْوَانَا أَنَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ حِرًا بِنَا عَلَمِينَ Let's conclude with the dua and so on. سبحان الله ميو حاب الله مسني على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد مبارك وسنة ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا our kind and generous Lord that being who gave us everything from the moment we were born يا الله ظلمنا أنفسنا we have wronged and oppressed our own selves we have left obeying your rules يا الله we have broken your commandments we have broken the sunnahs of your beloved messenger. Ya Allah, today we testify that we have deceived no one but our own selves. We have betrayed and wronged no one but our own selves. But Ya Allah, if you do not send your maghfira, your forgiveness upon us, or your rahmah, your mercy upon us, let a khasrin that truly will be amongst the lost ones. Ya Allah, forgive us for the sins that we did in the day. Forgive us for all the sins that we have ever done. Forgive us for the sins that we did in the day. Forgive us for the sins that we did at night. Forgive us for the sins that we did alone. Forgive us for the sins that we did in the company of others. Ya Allah, forgive us for the sins that we did in the past. Forgive us for the sins that we still do in the present. Ya Allah, forgive us for the sins that we remember. Forgive us for the sins that we have forgotten. Ya Allah, forgive us for the sins that we did to ourselves. Forgive us for the sins that we did to others. Ya Allah, out of your rahmah, accept our tawbah today. Accept our repentance today. Ya Allah, we pledge to you that from this moment on, we want to lead our life according to the Qur'an, Sunnah, and Sharia. That we want to lead a life that is pleasing to you. Ya Allah, from the tips of our hair to the soles of our feet, change us and transform us in a way that is pleasing to you. Ya Allah, make us follow this Qur'an, Sunnah, and Sharia. Ya Allah, if we are lazy, if we are unwilling, drag us by our hair and make us follow the Qur'an, Sunnah, and Sharia. Ya Allah, forgive us for our sins. Ya Allah, keep us away from the friends of sin. Keep us away from those who invite us to sin. Ya Allah, keep us away from the gatherings of sin. Keep us away from the opportunities of sin. Ya Allah, we are your weak and sinning servants. Ya Allah, we cannot handle these tests. Ya Allah, Ta'ala, out of your mercy, protect us from sin. Ya Allah, make us mahfuz. Put us in your special protection. Give us the ability to overcome our nafs. Give us the ability to subdue shaitan. Give us the ability to become people of taqwa. Ya Allah, shower your special rahman, your mercy upon us. Ya Allah, shower one glance of love upon us. Ya Allah, remove the distance that we have from you in our heart. Ya Allah, how many years will go by before we feel you in our salah? How many years will go by before we feel you in our sajda? Ya Allah, we beg of you to draw us close unto you. We too also want to feel your qurb and your nearness. We too also want to have the ma'afa, have the deep knowledge of you. Ya Allah, shower your rahmah upon us. Ya Allah, you may have billions of servants in the world, but Ya Allah, we have only one you. Ya Allah, if you refuse us today, there is no place else for us to go. Ya Allah, we are in your house in the masjid of Allah. Ya Allah, no host lets his guest go away empty-handed. Ya Allah, we beg of you to accept our du'as. Ya Allah, you yourself commanded us in the Qur'an, فَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ You commanded us that we should not reject the person who is sa'i, who asks of us. Ya Allah, if this is a command for us, your weak servants, Ya Allah, we are also sa'ileen. We are also asking at your door. Ya Allah, you are arhamar rahimeen. You are the most merciful of the merciful ones. Ya Allah, grant us our du'as. Forgive us for our sins. Accept our tawbah on this day. Ya Allah, your beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when people from different parts of the world meet just for your sake, you send a special sakina, a special rahmah upon that gathering. Ya Allah, today people from different parts of the world have gathered. We have met one another only for your sake. 
only to increase in our love for you, only to learn how to draw close from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws closer to you. Shower your rahman sakina upon this gathering and accept our dua. Ya Allah, any one of us who may have sickness, grant us health. Any one of us who may have financial difficulties, grant us the rizqi halal tayyib, the purest and noblest forms of wealth. And Ya Allah, those of us who have health, who have wealth, who have nothing but our own laziness to blame, Ya Allah, overcome, let us overcome our laziness. Make us people of action. Make us people who follow this deen. Make us people who practice our knowledge. Make us people of amal. Make us people of ikhlas. Ya Allah, make us amongst the muttaqeen. Make us amongst the muhsineen. Make us amongst the tawabeen. Make us amongst the awabeen. Make us amongst the sabireen and the lakireen and the makarrabeen. Ya Allah, make us amongst the mu'mineen. And let us die amongst the muslimin. Ya Allah, bless this masjid. Bless the halls of this masjid. Make this masjid always a gathering of the people of taqwa. Let this masjid produce the people of taqwa. Let this masjid be a shining light for the Qur'an, Sunnah, and Sharia until the Yawm al-Din. Let the nur of this masjid spread to the four corners of the world. Ya Allah, reward all of those who are involved in this masjid. Ya Allah, reward all of those who even look upon this masjid with one glance of love. Ya Allah, accept all of us for your deen. Accept us for the service of your deen. Ya Allah, for those of us who have children, make this the coolness of our eyes. Ya Allah, preserve our children from the temptations of sin around them. Ya Allah, we may do everything we can for our children, but Ya Allah, we ask that you do everything that you can for them. Keep them in your hifaza, keep them in your protection, and save them from the society around them. Ya Allah, preserve the iman of our children, and preserve the iman of all of our descendants until the yawm al-deen. Rabbana ta'kamal minna, innaka anta samiul alim, wa tubu alayna, innaka anta tawabu rahim, wa sallallahu ta'ala ala habibihi Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in, bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin.